Yeah, good morning and uh, welcome to class. Uh, the last time we had said or we had discussed the accounting adjustments that are done to the short-term financial measures and we said uh, they are incorporated in what we call the economic value added statement. So there is a question number five in our handout on pages uh, 15 to 16. And the question requires us to draw a statement of division performance or EVA. So that is what we are going to do. So we are going to draw economic value added statements. Uh, we have the company here. We have the head office, the head office, So we have division A. We have division B. We have division uh, C. Then we have details here. So this is economic value added statements, economic value added statement. So design that. Uh, remember when we are drawing economic value added, uh, we say we start with the conventional income. So this is conventional income, conventional income. Conventional income is the income that is uh, prepared in the financial statements. And this one, we are going to get it in the table. That is on page 16 up there. You can see where it's written profit before interest and tax. For division A, we have 5.7. Division B, we have 5.6. Division C, we have 5.8. Head office, we have minus 
and the company is 15.2, 15.2. Now, after you do that, the next thing that you bring on board is called the adjustments. So you bring the adjustments here, and uh, in these adjustments, in these adjustments, uh, the very first, but is not even mentioned in the notes, is anything that is in the head office. Not unless the question is very clear that you should not adjust the head office items. So we have the head office loss, the head office loss, and uh, in most of the questions, they will direct you on how to share. But if the question has not directed on how you will share, we use the turnover. We use the turnover. So the turnover that will be used will be like this. You can see turnover again in the table up there. We have uh, 81.7. You divide this by 376.7, you multiply by minus 1.9. I think for the interest of space, I will, you will have the working somewhere. Janet, welcome. For the interest of my space, you will have the workings somewhere. Uh, so I'm simply saying, it is going to be uh, in the one out of seven, you divide by 376.7 times minus 1.9. The next one is uh, going to be 3.2 out of 376.7. We are answering the question that is on page 15 and 16. That is question number five. Okay, multiplied by minus 1.9, and then uh, to that 1.8, you divide by 376.7 times minus 1.9. So when you work it out, it will be in the 1.9 uh, times 1.9, you divide by 376.7, uh, that gives us minus 0 0.4, it's negative 0 0.4, uh, 63.2 times 1.9, you divide by 376, that gives us minus 0 0.3, and then this other one, because now they must add to, because they must add to, 1.9, I'll say 1.9 minus 0.4 minus 0.3, and this one becomes minus 1.2, and then you put the positive 1.9 there, so that that disappears, and there is nothing that goes to the head office. You need to welcome. We are dealing with the question number 15. Question number five, that is on page 15 of our handouts. Right, so after that, the next thing that we are supposed to do is to adjust for, if you look at uh, the second table that is on page 15, the one that reads, analyst adjustments to income statement for the period added, we have the profit before tax, which he has used uh, 13.6. Uh, but for us, we have used 15.2. Uh, it is because for him, it was before tax. But for us, it was before interest. So ours should be higher. So the first adjustment he has made is uh, interest, net interest, uh, net interest net interest. So in regard to the net interest, we are guided by, or he has brought an amount of 1.6. And that 
we will get it from uh, we are going to get it from uh, oh that one we are not going to adjust sorry that one we are not going to include it because for us uh, if you look at the table number one there we used profit before interest so this one had not been subtracted so that's why we are going to skip it because we have begun with the profit before interest. But for him, he began the profit after interest. That's why he has to add. The next thing that we have to bring on board is research. Is uh, research. Now research is uh, 2.1. And looking at it, we have, uh, when you look at uh, page 16, there are some bullets up there, the big dots. And the second one says research and development relates entirely to division B. So the amount is uh, 2.1. So that one should be brought here to division B. And it should also come here to the company 2.1 to come there to the company 2.1. The next item that has been mentioned is advertising. Advertising. Now in advertising, in advertising, the amount is uh, 2.3. And if you look at the bullet there, you can see that belongs to division A. So I will come here where there is A, I put 2.3, where there is A, 2.3, and then in the company here, I put 2.3. Ah, yeah. The next one is uh, amortization of goodwill. There is goodwill here. Amortization of goodwill. So in the amortization of goodwill, uh, you can see in information number, rather the bullets, we are told the goodwill to be written off depend, uh, belongs to division B and division C. So down there as part of your workings, to share this goodwill is going to be 10.3, which is divided by 40.7. Uh, you multiply by the amount. The amount of goodwill used here is 1.3. Then we have uh, 30.4. You divide by 40.7, multiply by 1.3. So if you divide that way, you are going to tell me this 10.3 times uh, 1.3 you divide by 40.7. That gives us 0 0.3. Now 0 0.3 is what should come to division B here. And therefore it goes without saying, division C should receive one so that they are adding to 1.3. And then the company has 1.3. The company has 1.3. Uh, the next thing is uh, taxation. Taxation. Now, when it comes to taxation, we have not been uh, told how to share. But as I have said, when the question is quiet on how to share the corporate items, you use turnover. So once again, down there in our working, so you can see if you can fit. To share the tax, tax you can see is 4.8. So it's uh, negative 4.8, negative 4.8, negative 4.8. Uh, so when I start the workings, I'm going to find it 1.7 times 4.8. You divide by 376.7. And this gives me negative 
Then 63.2 multiplied by 4.8, you divide by 376.7. Uh, that gives me minus 0 0.8. And then it goes without saying that this must be minus 3.0. So that here I have minus 4.8. So that in the company I have minus 4.8. So those are the items that are included in the analysts adjustments. In the analysts adjustments. And if those are the items, we are going now to have what we call revised income and this revised income we can call it e we can call it e the revised income after the adjustments have been done we will call it uh, e we will call it e so uh, for the first one, it will be 5.7 minus 0.4 plus 2.3 minus 1. I'm getting 6.6. .6. When you go to the next one, you say 5.6 minus 0.3 plus 2.1 plus 0.3 minus 0.8 is 6.9 then 5.8 minus 1.2 plus 1 minus 3 is 2.6 this is 0 then 15.2 plus 2.1 plus 2.3 plus 1.3 minus 4.8 is 16.1. Sharin, welcome. We are dealing with question number five that is on pages 15 and 16 of our adults. So that is about the revised income. Now from there, we bring what we call Conventional capital. Conventional capital. Conventional capital. And uh, the conventional capital that we are going to bring is the one that is mentioned in our statement up there on page 16, the division of performance, where you can see there are total assets, less current liabilities. So division A has 27.1, division B has uh, 23.9, this other one has 23.2, this one has 3.2, and the total here is 77.4. 77.4. Then you come and do the adjustments. The adjustments. Now the adjustments that we are going to do, the first one is the head office assets. It is the head office assets. Head office assets. Now this head office assets, Again, we are going to share using turnover. We are going to share using turnover. And uh, this turnover, uh, this head of its assets, they are 3.2. It is 3.2, it is 3.2. So that is what we shall uh, use. So if I take my calc, I'm finding in the 1.7 multiplied by 3.2 divided by 376.7, 
that gives me 0 0.7 here. And that's us as an SMA 63.2 times 3.2 divided by 376.7. I have 0 0.5. Uh, to that 1.8. Now, because they must add to 3.2, I will take 3.2, I less 0.7, I less 0.5. And that gives us a uh, 2. So this is 2.0. And then this one, I make it negative so that they disappear because we have shared. So the company is not going to experience them at that point. Uh, now from there, we bring these other adjustments. If you look at uh, table three on page 15, table three on page 15, uh, you can see the capital and reserves 54.8. But for us, you can see we have begun with 77.4. The difference is uh, because for us, we have only less the current liabilities, but the long-term liabilities, we still have them. And those two long-term liabilities are borrowings and deferred tax. If you are to take the 15 and 7.6, you add them back to 54.8, they will bring you back to this 77. I'm saying, if you can see where we have the capital reserves of 54.8, you add 15 and you add 7.6. Uh, the value there will be 77.4. It is because the analyst who did this uh, table did not consider or had not considered the long term. But for us, we have considered that's why we are starting at a higher value. So having said that, the next one that comes in is research. Research comes in, uh, and research is an amount of 17.4. And as we had read earlier in the bullets that are on page 16, is that research belongs to division B. So that amount of 17.4, 17.4, uh, and 17.4. That way. Then from there, we have advertising. Advertising. Now, advertising, uh, as you can see, it is uh, 10.5, and advertising belongs to Division A. So 10.5. So, Nakibia Huku, Unaweka 10.5. 10.5. Uh, then the next one is uh, Goodwill. Is Goodwill. So, Goodwill, when it comes to Division B, it is 10.3. And uh, Division uh, C, it is 30.4, so that we have uh, a total of 40.7. A total of 40.7. So we have a total of 40.7. Those are the items that required to be adjusted for. Uh, so with that now, we can come here. And get what we call revised capital. 
revised capital. So revised capital is F. Revised capital is F. So this becomes a uh, twenty seven point one plus point seven plus ten point five is thirty eight point three. Twenty three point nine plus point five plus seventeen point four plus ten point three is 52.1 uh, then 23.2 plus 2 plus 30.4 is 55.6 this is 0 77.4 plus 17.4 plus 10.5 plus 40.7 so this is one four six. That is one forty six. Now from there, you are supposed to get what we call the cost of capital. The cost of capital. And this cost of capital, if you look at uh, what we have in uh, the third table on page 15, where there is required return, it is 12% of capital. So we are going to get it as 0 0.12 of the capital, 0 0.12F, and we can call it G. So E Aquaza, I will say 0.12 times 38.3, is 4.596.12 times 52.1 is 6.252.12 times 55.6 is 6.672 and 0.12 of 146 is 17.52, 17.52. And finally now we get economic annual EVA. Now EVA will be given as the revised capital which we had gotten as E, you minus the cost of capital uh, which is G. So E minus G. So as to answer the division A, we will have 6.6 .6 minus 4.596. And we record 2.004. Uh, we will begin at 6.9 minus 6.252. Uh, we will have 0 0.648. All right, we will begin at 2.6, you less 6.672, you will have minus 4.072, this is zero. And then the last one, 16.1 minus 17.52 is negative 1.42. So that is how it's done. So once you finish copying, let me know. Type the one finished uh, so that we take the next step.
So have we finished? Okay. Only one person has reached the others.
Good. I can see we are finished. Then from there now, we are supposed to proceed, but on your own, you shall uh, attempt, on your own, you shall attempt the other questions that are given there. Shall attempt the other questions that are given there so that we proceed with our discussions. And uh, as I told you, this discussion is very, very important as far as your examiner is concerned. So the first thing that we need to look at is what we call financial statement analysis. Financial statement analysis. Financial statement analysis. Now, when we talk about financial statement analysis, as you can see in uh, page 17, it is the process of critically examining in details the accounting information given in financial statements and reports. So we are talking of critical examination. When we mention something like, uh, uh, we call something critical, it means we are seeking to get more details than what has been provided. It is, for example, we met and I told you my name is Kimani. If you just uh, take it and move on to the next item, then that is called face value interpretation. But when you want to do a critical interpretation or a critical analysis of the name Kimani, you will start asking me some questions like, how do we write the name Kimani? Where does the name Kimani come from in this country? Uh, what relationship do you have with another Kimani I found, uh, I met the other day? What is the meaning of the word Kimani? So you want to dig deeper. Now digging deeper is what we are calling critical examination. And that is the basis of financial statement analysis. So we are not just going to be satisfied with what you have been shown, like we are told profit is 20. We need to know these 20, how did it, uh, how was it arrived at? Uh, last time, did we get more, did we get less? In the next period, are we going to get more or less? So we, we, we get critical, we get deeper. That's what we mean by critical examination. Now, this is uh, done because we have four main objectives. The first objective is to assess the past, the present, and the future performance. So we are concerned with the performance of the organization. Number two, we want to look at, uh, so the first thing I'm saying, we are looking at the performance of the organization. Number two, we want to see the efficiency of the company. We want to judge the efficiency, how efficient is this company that we are analyzing. The other thing that we want to see is called liquidity. We want to judge liquidity of the company. That is how liquid is the company. Can we be able to satisfy debts as and when they arise? And the last objective is uh, when we want to compare ourselves with others in the sector. Are we doing well or are we doing poorly? Because we could be crying, uh, thinking that we are doing so poorly, only to go and see that even our neighbors are also crying. And that makes us to be a bit comfortable when we realize we are not the only ones. Or we could be thinking that we are doing so well, only to meet our neighbors and find that they are doing extremely better than us. Uh, so that means we need to, to, to wake up and put more effort. So this issue of comparison is very, very important. So those are the three, or rather the four, uh, objectives of financial performance analysis, that is performance, efficiency, liquidity, and comparison. 
Now, this uh, financial statement analysis, it is done using three procedures. There are three procedures that we take when we are doing this uh, analysis. And these procedures, the first one is what we call selection. Now, in the selection, it is where you choose what you want, it is where you choose what you want. When you look at a financial statement, it has very many things. If, for example, if you look at income statement, it starts with sales all the way to the net profit. Now, all those things, they may not all of them be of interest to you. So you would pick what is it that you want. Like if you look at what we do in forecasting, we pick two items. One, we call it X, and the other one, we call it Y. Then after you have uh, picked those items, you now do something we call relation. Now, relation it is where you develop the relationship that is existing between your two items. What is the relationship that exists between net profit and gross profit? What is the relationship that is existing between uh, tax payable and sales made, and so on? Uh, when you do that, you form, for example, an equation. Uh, an equation like we normally say y is equals to a plus bx. You can even use the real data and tell us this is 10 plus 4x. So you develop a relation. You come up with the equation on a function. Now, having done that, you now proceed to step number three, which we call evaluation, which we call evaluation. Now, in evaluation, it is where you seek to interpret. It is where you seek to tell us 10 is the value of y that does not change. 4 is the value of y that is changing as x changes by one unit. And you can even use this one now to predict. For example, if you are told x is uh, 10, now you can tell us y predicted to be 10 plus 4 times 10, which now will give us 50. That is what we call evaluation. Uh, those are the three steps or the three procedures that we take when we are doing financial statements analysis. The next thing that we need to discuss is the, the techniques or the methods that are used in uh, financial statements analysis. Now, in these methods, we have number one, what we call ratio analysis. Now, when we talk of a ratio, a ratio is simply a number that is expressed in terms of another number. That is how simple I can put it. It is a number that is expressed in terms of another number. And uh, there are many ratios that you have come across in your other studies. You have come across profitability ratios, the trading ratios, the evaluation, the capital, the gearing, the liquidity, and so on. Now, the agenda in this subject is not to show you how to compute the ratios, but at least to bring to your remembrance that these ratios exist. And also number two, to remind you how to interpret the ratios. So uh, when you come across the ratios, you should be able to tell us what it means. And I believe because you have done that, it is not something difficult. Now, looking at ratios, they have some advantages. One, they provide a greater clarity and deep understanding of the information that is not otherwise apparent. Why that is so is because ratios simplify data. And when you simplify data, people get a better understanding, a better understanding of the simple data. But if you are to bring us voluminous data, like maybe you are doing some groups of accounts, eh, you are doing all those consolidations, kuna parent, kuna subsidiaries, kuna nini, all those voluminous data, people will get lost along the way. Uh, they may not, uh, they may start with you, but they may not finish with you. But when it is presented in ratios, in terms uh, that are very simple, then people are able to understand. Uh, number two, it helps us in formulating financial policies. Once we are able to understand, we can now be able to commit the best financial policies. And then it also helps us in uh, doing effective control because once you have understood something or even someone, you can be in a position to control them. But on the other side, we have limitations. Uh, one, it is very difficult to decide on the proper basis of comparison. Now, the issue is what we compare ourselves with. Uh, like for you people now that you are in my class, if I want to compare your performance, 
what basis do I use? Do I use those who come physical and those who are online? Do I use gender? Do I use age? So what basis do I use? So because finally I must use a base so that I compare, then some people will obviously complain because they wanted this uh, base and uh, this other one was used. So people will always complain. Uh, it's just like what is happening in the IPC. There is the issue of the manual and the, the digital. Uh, uh, because now IPC must finally settle on one, then you'll find the other side will complain because these ones want digital, the other one want manual, and we can't use both or we cannot. Uh, there are times you can use the hybrid, but there are times you may not use the hybrid. You cannot combine. So whoever, uh, whoever's reference has not been taken will be left complaining and they contest the results. Uh, the other one is uh, the price level changes. Prices keep on changing. And you know in accounting, we are guided by what we call the historical concept. Historical concept means you use the figures that were prevailing at the time of the transaction. Like by the time we will be closing the year and we'll be doing the accounts for this year, 2022, uh, if your company was buying bread, if uh, bread is one of the items, then the bread that was bought in January, you will give it a price of 50. But right now, I'm told the bread is uh, almost 70. So you see now, when it is at the, the end of December, maybe by then it will be almost 80 or 100. Uh, so by December, you are telling us the price of a loaf of bread was, is 50, while actually it is 90. So that brings uh, confusion. Uh, nowadays in advanced financial reporting, I don't know whether they still teach you a little bit on how to adjust those price level changes. In our days it was there. Uh, we need to confirm whether they still teach you something like that. The other thing is uh, statistical and uh, scientific analysis is also not very easy. When we are doing hypothesis testing, when we are doing migration, you find most of us will want to shy off. Uh, because it's not something very easy. And there is also the issue of seasonal factors. Uh, these are factors that come and they affect data. Like uh, we have been going through Corona, COVID-19, it is a factor that is affecting us. Uh, we are now going through the general uh, election. Uh, it's also a factor that is affecting businesses. You cannot ignore it. And many other seasonal factors that come and they have a dimension or they have an impact on the figures that we report in the business. The other thing is uh, what we call use of different accounting methods. Uh, when it comes to accounting, we have different methods that can be used. You could use, like for, for example, the valuation of stocks. You can choose to use P4 when someone else is using P4. Uh, then those two methods will give us different answers. When it comes to computation of depreciation, one person can choose to use reducing balance method and another person chooses to use straight line method. Now, those two methods, again, will give us different uh, results. So we need to know which method are we going to use. So that is about ratios. The second method is called trend analysis. Now, trend analysis is what we covered in section four, known as time series. And uh, trend analysis, it is where you compare the performance of the company over different periods. You look at what did they do in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. And uh, that now can help you to understand, to understand the company and even now be in a position to project going to the future. Uh, that is called trade analysis. And you have been given some figures there which you can be able to look at. Uh, the problems of trade analysis are number one, comparison becomes difficult when the unit of measurement changes value due to general inflation. Again, I've already addressed that. It is uh, what I have called price level changes. So when price changes, uh, when inflation levels changes, uh, change, you find that it is a bit uh, difficult. But I think in FM, you must be covering how to adjust for inflation, how to deal with the figures, that are uh, obtained at different rates of inflation, there is, a, there is a way you harmonize them. Now, part B is that if the enterprise environment changes over time, 
with the result that performance that was considered satisfactory in the past may no longer be considered so. As in uh, previously, when circumstance was not was a particular time, you are considered a winner. But now things have changed, so you cannot be considered a winner. Yeah. Uh, and we know those things. The other thing is that it may require this is normalization. If you remember a bit of your QA, when you are doing the time series, we would draw the big sheet so that we are able to decisionalize. Now, that process of decisionalization is not very easy, especially if you are dealing with voluminous data. So many people will cite it as a challenge, and therefore they will not use this method of trade analysis. The next method is called cross-sectional analysis. Cross-sectional analysis. Now, the cross-sectional analysis, it is where you compare a company's performance with performance of other companies. So like now you can compare Destiny with Star College, with Strathmore, with KCA and so on. You can compare NTV with Citizen, with K24. You can compare NACMAT, or oh, NACMAT is no more. You can compare Naivas with QuickMart and uh, the others that are there. So it is comparing companies that are in the same field. Uh, obviously, with, uh, you, can, you can even make it to be thread. You say for the last five years, this one has performed this way, this one this way, this one this way, and then from there, you make your own conclusions. Now, this method is very, very good, but uh, unfortunately, it also has some drawbacks because number one, firms may have businesses which are diversified to different levels. As in, you come to a school like Destiny, we only offer CPA, but you go to Strathmore, they offer CPA and they offer degree programs. You go to KCA, they offer CPA and they have other programs. So if you are now comparing us, then you find that there will be a gap somewhere. There will be a gap somewhere because we are diversified to different extents. The other thing is uh, the businesses operating in the same industry may be substantially different in that they may manufacture the same product, but one may be using rented equipment while the other one is using their own. Again, coming back to the case of uh, my example, that is Destiny at a school like KCA. You find Destiny is in a rented building, but KCA, they are in their own premises. So when you want to compare our performances, it cannot be the same. We are paying rent, they are not paying rent. It is just like even in our private lives. If someone is in a rental house and another one, they are in their own house, they are in their own home, they are not paying rent. Those people, they are different. You cannot compare them uh, to a greater extent. You will start noticing differences. The other thing is that the funds could be using different policies. As I mentioned earlier, one could be using LIFO, the other one could be using FIFO. When it comes to human resource, you find one is using cash for laborers, the other one they are using uh, permanent and pensionable workers. Again, that is also a major contributor to differences in uh, comparison. But all said and done, it is very, very important to uh, do the cross-sectional analysis. And the last method that we use in financial statement analysis is called common size. Now, in common size, you get one item, you turn to the other page, you turn to the other page, you can see the income statement that is presented there. So what you do, you take one item of the many items in a statement and you make it 100%. Then all the others, you express them as percentages of that. So it is like, again, going back to ratio analysis. And the objective is to reduce the data without losing the meaning, without losing the substance of the data. But uh, we, we reduce it to, small, uh, to smaller figures in terms of percentages. So when you compare, like now what you can see here, the two percentages are very small. Like for example, cash, it has 25 and the other one has 15. So this one, you don't require to be a very smart mathematician to know that cash has reduced by 10. So that is what you're saying to express them in terms of a common figure and they become very, very easy to, uh, to understand. So that is about the financial statements analysis. We have looked at the definition, we have looked at the procedures, we have looked at the objectives, we have looked at the methods. 
Now from there, there is something else called segmental reporting. Now segmental reporting, it is nothing new, but uh, exactly what we did the other day, and we called it responsibility accounting or performance measurement. Actually, it is also what we have done a while ago when we had division A, division B, division C. So they are one and the same thing. It is only that when you are in financial reporting, we use the word segmental reporting. Actually, in our days, we used to call it departmental accounting, whereby you would account for each department. Nowadays, in financial reporting, it is called segmental. But when you come to management accounting, we call it responsibility accounting. Why do we call it responsibility accounting? Is because if you remember what we said when we began this topic, is that each department is perceived as a responsibility center. And the manager of that department is held accountable of what happens. So when we call it responsibility accounting, then we are looking at a way or how do we measure accountability of this man or this lady that we have put in charge of that department. So by all those very many words, I'm simply saying segmental reporting is performance measurement, it is responsibility accounting, it is what we already have done. Uh, I don't have a question right now, but I know in the past few months there is a quick, there is a question. Uh, but now, for the interest of time, I uh, will not uh, go to that direction. Now, the next thing that we need to mention is called management controls. Management controls. Management controls. Now, management controls. They are simply the procedures that are implemented in an organization to ensure that work proceeds as expected. For example, those of you who have come here physical or physically, you have seen at the entrance, you are required to produce your document. Now, the, that requirement is to ensure that only the students who have complied with the fee issues are allowed to get to the classroom. So those are parts of procedures, we call them management controls. They are the procedures we take to ensure that work is proceeding as per the expectation. Uh, we, we normally do not use the word control quite often because the word control is taken to be a bit uh, judgmental, is taken to be a bit, uh, 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 what should I say? Uh, it is already in beauty. When, you, when I'm telling you, bring your car because I want to control you. It's already, it's like I've already concluded that you're in the wrong or you have the, the intention to do something wrong. But when I tell you, let me see your card, there's a matter of policy. That's what we do things here or how we do things here. The word policy is a bit catchless. So in most of the organizations, you will hear people talking of the policy as opposed to the controls. Now we have two types of controls. One, there is what we call the preventive controls. And then we have what we call the diagnostic controls. Now, preventive, they are the ones that we do to ensure that the wrong thing does not happen. The mistake does not take place. Like the guy who is at the gate, when they ask for your documentation, that is a preventive control. But there are times the preventive controls can be evaded or can fail. So we may need now to come physically to the class where the students are seated and each one of them is told to produce their documentations. Now, when you have now gone to the class where the students are, that is now called diagnostic. You are trying now to tweet out to check whether there is a mistake that has already happened. It is, uh, if you look at uh, our phones, most of us, we use passwords. We have those patterns, we know them. Now, the pattern that you use on your phone it is a preventive measure. It is to ensure a person who is not authorized does not access your phone or does not access the content of your phone. But if for some reasons you realize that they already have access, you may need to know what is it that they have already seen. What information have they already extracted? Now, when you are seeking that, then we call it diagnostic. Or maybe you go to a company and there is some money that uh, you are withdrawing, maybe even in the bank. 
uh, you will find the cashier going to the back office and you may even get the manager calling you, uh, seeking to confirm whether it is you withdrawing the money. That is also part of uh, preventing. So we have those two types of management controls. We call them preventive and diagnostic. The other thing that you need to mention here is that in an organization, people do not always comply with the formal laid down controls. Even where you people you work, I know you have a code of conduct. You have a procedure of doing things. For example, you want an off day. There, is a doc there are documents that you're supposed to fill or you are supposed to notify your seniors. And even the, the period is usually uh, determined or is already communicated. But with the time, people beat those formals, those official procedures. And they start using informal. They start using unofficial procedures. It is a situation where I realize I will not come to work today. So instead of telling my boss that I will be away, I just tell my neighbor that to, uh, today I will not come. You just cover me. And you find we are able to cover each other. My neighbor will go to my desk, put the computer on, even place a bag there or place a address there, a coat or a bag, whatever, uh, and create an environment that looks like I'm around. So when the boss passes nearby, he will think that I've just stepped out for a while, but Sahio, I'm far away. So those are what we are calling the, 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 the culture and the organization, the value, the practices, which now are not the formal uh, management controls. But in an organization, you cannot avoid them. And to some extent, they come in a stronger way than what is official. Uh, the benefits of having these management controls are number one, we are able to remove risks. And we have very many risks, including our health risks. When we are controlling, for example, who comes to our premises, who joins our classes, we are number one, ensuring that we are safe. Otherwise, if you are to allow every Tom, Dick, and Harry get into our premises, you are compromising on your security. Uh, we are also looking at the financial risk. An institution like this, if we allow every person to come to class, even when they have not paid, we are faced with a financial risk because these people will be consuming our resources and they are not giving us money back to recover the cost that we have incurred. So as an institution, we will soon be going down because of uh, that financial risk. Uh, the other thing is that we should be able to, uh, to eliminate very excessive controls, even as we we campaign for controls, that does not mean we should be so bureaucratic. We should be too red uh, We should be a bit lenient. We should be able to bear. We should be able to create allowances. So these uh, controls should help us to remove those bureaucracies. And uh, number three, when you have these controls that are working, you increase the confidence of the people who are implementing them. You can imagine if you are the one who is supposed to stop students from getting to classes when they have not paid, and then you stop the student, and the student ran very fast to the principal, and the principal came fuming fire, uh, making noise to you, why are you preventing the student from getting to class? Allow them. Actually, let the student go to class. Now, if you are the security person, you will feel that next time you don't have the confidence to stop that person. You see them coming and you give them way. But if you stop them and they then to the principal to complain, and the principal tells them that that is the procedure and they still have to come back to you, then you have the confidence. So when we have these uh, controls working, we increase, uh, we increase confidence among our staff, which is a very, very important success factor in any organization. The other thing that we need to mention is what we call management information systems in management accounting. And uh, management information systems, there is nothing much that I need to discuss other than to remind you that the IT that you did in section four or wherever it was, uh, you came across the ICT either in section two or section four. And uh, we are simply saying that you need to use the uh, the, the, the information technology uh, knowledge in doing man management accounting, in even doing management. 
So we must incorporate. Like for example, in this class right now, this is uh, the use of IT. That's why you are able to have your class even when you have not come here physically. So I'm still able to teach even when I'm alone in the room because we are making use of technology. If we were not able to make use of these management information systems, then it will be very difficult. All our benefits will be minimal. But when as a manager, you are able to appreciate uh, the benefits that you can get by employing technology, then you find that your company will reap big benefits. Now in doing this, eh, we know that a computer has very many advantages. It is uh, able to handle voluminous data in a way that is accurate, in a way that is uh, fast, in a way that is presentable and so on. And they generate a lot of reports. Uh, nowadays, we are almost, uh, everything is almost digital. Uh, everything is digital. Mm -hmm. we, are, we, we are also now <clears throat> on a very strong path uh, towards use of plastic cash. We are no longer now, most of us, using the physical money. We are just transacting over the technological platforms, which is very, very good. Now, a good management uh, accounting information system should be able to produce information that has three dimensions. One is about time. When you are communicating, remember management accounting is about communication. You must give us information that has a time dimension. When we talk about time, we are talking of timeliness. Don't communicate too early, don't communicate too late. If you communicate too early, people will doubt what you're saying. But, uh, and when you communicate when it is too late, again, it creates a memory, especially if it's a negative information. If you saw that my things are not moving on well, and you just watch, only to come and say it alone when everything has uh, been scattered, that you had seen it, then I will not take you to be my friend. It creates a memory. So you need to communicate right on time or right in time uh, at the appropriate time. Then this communication must be current. Uh, don't communicate uh, information that is uh, outdated. Uh, the frequency, it must be known. That's why even in a class like this one, we have a timetable. We know every Saturday from 8.30 to 10.30, we will have a class. So that frequency creates a lot of uh, trust, a lot of, uh, uh, it enables planning, even you from where, from your end, you are able to plan your activities. But you can imagine a situation where we don't have, a situation where we don't have a frequency, a plan. Unakaka, unasikia kuna class, ya eme, luko mepaka, na hile taimu luko nafikia kuna class, unapiwa hakuna, it creates a lot of disorganization. It disorients people and results in confusion and eventually there are no results that are obtained or there are no good results. The time period we must be able to say what is the time period that we are communicating. The next thing is what we call content. When you are talking to people like now the way I'm doing it, you must look at the content. What is contained? What is the substance of the communication? And uh, here we look at the accuracy. Are you giving people something that is accurate? Even the handout like this one that we are reading, is it accurate? You need to check, is it relevant? What I'm telling you, is it relevant to your objective, to your passing of the exam? You must communicate in a complete way. Uh, you can imagine if I were to tell you that I am through or time is over and we have five more topics that we have not covered. That will weaken you as you go to the exam. But when I tell you we are through with the syllabus, uh, we have completed everything, it gives you confidence that now you are well prepared, you are ready to handle uh, whatever is ahead. The issue of scope, you must not be too brief, too shallow. You must also not be too detailed. Ensure that you cover the scope well. Ensure that you are concise. Don't give us a lot of information that is irrelevant and ensure that the information can generate performance. Performance means eh, uh, you can now be able to do something that previously you could not do before you got this information. Like before you joined the accounting classes, you could not perform anything in an account office. But after you have been in a class of accounting, if we take you to uh, an accounting office, we expect you to perform. 
And uh, if that performance is weakness, then we'll be able to say that our information has been successful. The other thing is what we call form and uh, the information that you are communicating, you must ensure that it is in the right form. And when we talk about form, there are issues that we look at. One of them is clarity. You must be very clear. Uh, don't give us things that are not clear. Like now, when I write somewhere here, uh, somewhere here, you see now that part is not clear. You cannot see what I've written. So you must ensure that there is clarity. Details, again, I say don't give us a lot of details. Uh, the issue of order, your work should be well arranged. You should be able to see uh, where you are starting, where you are, and where you are ending. Uh, there should be the issue of presentation. It should be well presented. And the media, the media that you are using is very, very important. Now, there are some challenges that are usually encountered as far as technology is concerned. One of them is the strategic business challenge. Coming up with strategies is also not very easy. Uh, the issue of globalization, where you find that uh, now we have become one small village. Uh, I remember the other day when we had that uh, COVID-19 is uh, in China. We could think it is very far away. It is miles away. We could not imagine it coming to our villages here in Kenya. But within no time, it was here because we have become a global village, just one small village, and things are, are circulating very fast from one corner of the world to the other one. So that is a challenge as far as IT is concerned. Uh, the, act, the architecture or the infrastructure, uh, that is also becomes a challenge. You saw the other day that Twitter had, uh, had some outages. So those are issues that we need to check. Information investment, how much are we going to invest in our systems? That is an issue that we need to check. And then responsibility and control. Uh, just a minute, I respond to a call here. Uh, you can be looking at the other items that are remaining.
Okay, so we proceed now uh, and look at what we call the contingency theory of management. And uh, you know from your leadership and management, there are different perspectives of management on different theories. There is what we call the classical theories or the traditional theories, uh, which were forwarded by the likes of uh, Henry Fayol, Max Weber, Frederick Taylor, and so on. And those classical theories, they come up with the prescriptions, they come up with the procedures. That's why you see, even today, much of what we study, it has uh, what we call assumptions and it has what we call steps because their foundation is in those classical theories. But we also have uh, what we call the contingency theory or the situation of factors that do not prescribe of what should be done in a particular situation. And they say you handle a situation as it unfolds. So that means when someone insults you, we cannot tell you how to deal with them. You decide as at that point how to deal with them. The classical theory will give you the procedures that you are supposed to follow, the steps. But situational says, you just look at the situation, respond as things unfold on the ground. So that is uh, what you mean by contingency theory. And I do not want to spend a lot of time there because you have done a lot in uh, leadership and management. But I want to emphasize that even as we do this situation of uh, leadership or this contingency management accounting, we must appreciate that there are some uh, differences. There are some factors that create differences. And some of these factors are one, the external environment. We could be looking like we are the same, but some of us are operating in different environments, the external environment. Maybe someone is sick, someone is having a, a stormy relationship, someone is going through economic issues. So our environments are not the same. So we react to things different uh, uh, because of those issues of the environment. The issues of strategies and mission, we use different strategies, we use different missions. Uh, there are those who uh, will take this strategy A, another one will take strategy B, all of them pursuing uh, even different things or the same thing, but the missions, the strategies are different. The other one is about the use of technology. You find we adopt technology to different levels. There are those of us who have even iPads, they have laptops, uh, they have computers, they have very serious phones, but some of us, we only have the capacity. We don't even have a laptop. We don't have a, a, even a smartphone. We are so manual. So those are levels of technology. Uh, that are adopted. Even schools like now, you can see Destiny is able to have online classes and physical classes at the same time. There are other schools that cannot have uh, online classes. So those are issues to do with how well you have adopted technology. Look at banks. There are some banks nowadays you can do, like that chat I'm told, you can do everything, everything that you could do in the bank uh, without any human person assisting you. You just interact with the machines, with technology. If it is withdrawing, if it is depositing, whatever you would want to do in the bank, you are able to do it in that hall through technological platforms. Uh, the other thing is that the farms interdependence. There are those farms that interdepend on each other. There are those that are not. Uh, even ourselves, we, we have some of us who depend on others. We have some of us who only have gold in ourselves. So all those things uh, you need to check, they create differences. The business units, the farm, the industry variables, that speaks almost to what I have said about the external environment. We have variables in our lives and those variables, they contribute to our differences. Some of us are married, some of us are married, some of us are advanced in age, some of us are still too young, some of us have money, some of us do not have, some of us are working, some of us are not working, some of us, very many variables that we can be able to cite. And all those variables will make us respond differently in the same circumstance. Uh, the issue of knowledge and some of the factors uh, that could speak to issues to do with uh, the IQ, we have different IQs. There are those of us who get things very fast. There are those of us who will take time uh, to get what is happening. They learn later 
or they come to understand the much later. Those are issues that you need to appreciate. The other thing which is very, very, very important, if you receive this, it is an area that you will not really miss. You will not miss in the exam. Most likely, even in your paper, you will bring something to do with the environment. It is something that has become very, very popular and very, very important in our modern day. And uh, there is something very, very simple. It is about creating awareness among people of the impact their actions have on the environment. For example, when I'm using this handout to teach you, what impact does this handout have on the environment? We must appreciate that this handout, which is a paper, it came because there was a tree that was cut down somewhere and it was processed to become a paper. And then I have the paper with me. After I am through with this paper, it will find its way to the dustbin. After the dustbin, we will go to the dump site. Now, when we cut down that tree, how did it affect the environment? If you remember a little bit of your basic biology and geography, you know that trees, they have an impact on the rain patterns. And uh, rain influences very many things, including uh, the very critical one of availability of food. And uh, when we interfere with rains, then you find there are many things that will be uh, happening. Water will be affected, even electricity, availability of water, even in a town like this one. Uh, when we now uh, print these papers and we take them to the dustbin and we take them to the Nandora dump site and wherever else, uh, what kind of impact are we creating? Those dump sites are health risks. We, we, we create effluents. So we must be told or we must start now appreciating that as I do what I'm doing, I am affecting the environment in a negative way. And when you appreciate that way, you can now start taking measures that are possible to minimize the effect, to minimize the effect that you could create on the negative effect that is that you could create on the environment. So basically, the benefits of this environmental accounting uh, number one, we are able to accurately track the costs. We are able to know where the costs are, those are affecting the environment. We are able to identify those costs. Uh, it also helps us to have comprehensive information on how we are performing as far as the environment is concerned. And then uh, we have the skills that are necessary for us to do this. Those skills, number one, we have been taught how to monitor to measure and control cost. That is something we have been doing in cost accounting and also management accounting. We can manage information systems, the use of computers, the issue of printing papers. We don't have to keep on printing. We can communicate via email. We can communicate via WhatsApp. Uh, like now that you people are online, it is saving us a lot of uh, photocopying costs, which have, uh, if many institutions were to go that direction, then you find that the forests will be safe. Because when I need to communicate to you, I don't need to print this copy. I just type and then I forward to you as a soft copy. Uh, the issue to do with uh, coming up with budgets, we just finished the topic on budgets. We are able to do that. We are able to formulate strategies. We are doing a lot of leadership and management uh, where I believe you are heavily taught on how to do strategies. And then you also offer highly regarded advice. When you are in a group of people who have not done accounts, you should be able to offer advice to them on how they can do things in the right way. Now, this information, you can get it from the general ledgers. That is, you can look at the accounts of a company and be able to pick those environmental related costs. Then you can also talk face to face. Uh, I have seen people go to the ground and ask people, what is the impact of this project in the environment? How is it affecting you? And you hear people saying, Tango, Wajenge factory happen. Our waters have been diverted, wild animals, uh, issues to do with the smokes, issues to do with the water, and so on. So you can talk to people, and they will also tell you the impact of uh, those projects. The other day, I saw them uh, interview some people uh, along uh, a road that has been built somewhere in Kiapu. Uh, while we appreciate, or while, while they were appreciating that the road is good, it has opened up the place, I could hear them point out at some of the problems that the road has created. So you can talk to people 
uh, and they will tell you some of those costs. Now, most of the, we, we have a lot of costs, but the most common are the ones that you can see there. We have the issue of waste and effluent and disposals. Like we know the river that is down here, the Nairobi River, we know the state of it. Issues to do with water, issues to do with energy, use of uh, uh, excessive energy. Uh, and here we are advised that we should use energy saving bulbs. Actually, if you look at even our place here, we have to change from the conventional bulbs to energy saving bulbs. And uh, if you are here during the day, you find <coughs> we also switch off some of the rights where we can use natural light. And that is what is recommended everywhere. You look at ways of conserving this power. Uh, issues to do with transport. You don't have to always be driving your car. You can. You, you, I, I know you know, here in Nairobi, we have a major problem of, of, of traffic. <clears throat> and anytime you are in traffic, if you look at the types of vehicles that make up that traffic jam, most of them are personal cars. So you can imagine 40 people have come to town with their cars. Now, if these 40 people would have left their cars and used one bus, then there will be no traffic. We spend less time, we pay less. Even our health is improved. Because some of us, when we are in traffic, we get so tired, we get so bored. We start even using data. We start thinking bad things. By the time you get to the house, even you have a headache. You have now to go and get some uh, maramojas and panadols and so on. All because we are not careful on how we do our transport system. We have had very many governments. Uh, at least now we have had two county governments. We are expecting to have another one. And all of them, they speak to the question of transport. But uh, none of them has succeeded. And one of the reasons why the government may not succeed in improving transport is because ourselves, we are not assisting the government. When the government is talking of uh, reducing, decongesting the city, you find that most of us, we are still insisting, I must use my car. I must come to town with my car. Now, then that creates a problem. Even if the government has done all what they can do. I, I saw them the other day, and uh, I believe you have seen this in the streets of Nairobi, they came and they did some pathways where they used to be parking. The objective was to chase away most of these personal cars that, are, that used to be parked here. But even after they have done that, we still have the parking full. People are still coming to town with their cars. So that is an issue that we need to really appreciate if you have a car. And uh, where you are going, you can use public means. It's better you use public means. You don't have necessarily to use your car. You can reserve your car for using to places where public means will be uh, inconvenient. But where public means are convenient, it is advisable. Uh, personally, I prefer using that so much. Uh, I prefer using public means uh, quite often. The other thing is, uh, issues to do with consumables and raw materials. Uh, and this is where you saw the government come in and intervene on the use of the plastic papers. Uh, they had to be banned because we were using these raw materials, the consumables, uh, the materials that cannot be recycled, and we could retire everywhere. And uh, that was not good. But at least the government, through NEMA, they have been able to bring some sanity on that. So even at personal level, you are called upon to really think, to really be sensitive on the impact you are creating uh, to the environment. And uh, we must come away or we must uh, move away from the thinking that this impact will not affect me right now. It is true it will not affect you right now, but remember you have people who are coming after you and will be affected. And none of us will want to leave our children behind in a place that they are not comfortable. We want to leave them in a better place than even without uh, how we found the place. So we must be conscious of that. The next thing is called exposed variances. Uh, exposed is uh, just the normal variances that we computed, but now they are broken down into two issues. There is what we call the planning element and the efficiency element. Maybe to explain, because the formula is there, uh, and maybe later on we shall come across a question as you revise, uh, is that when you plan something, you plan anticipating a particular environment status. But at the time of implementing the plan, 
the environment status would change. For example, you are planning to go home and you are planning that there will be no rain. So when you think there will be no rain, you expect to pay 50 shillings. But at the time of going home, there is rain. So the environment has changed and they charge you 8 So if they have charged you 8 it means you have an adverse variance of 30. You have an adverse variance of 30. So in the conventional variance, the one that we have been computing, you will be punished for overpaying this. But the ex post comes in and says, wait a minute, there was rain, and rain was beyond control. So as a result of rain, this variance came about. So we want to break down this into two. One is called the planning element. That is what is beyond control. And the other one is what is within control. Whereby we still, we ask ourselves, it is true there was rain, but when you realize there was rain, what measures did you take? Did you think of bargaining with Makanga at the charge rest? Did you think of remaining a little bit longer at the bus stop so that the fare could come down? Did you think of even walking a few meters uh, to look for a cheaper matatu? So those are things that were within your control. So if we do that analysis, uh, we are able maybe to break this into 10 and this 20. So what we shall do, for the rain, this one, you will not be punished because it was beyond your control uh, to have rains. But this one of negotiating with Makanga, Kukaka, uh, Kwa stage, Ama Kutembea, Kiyogo, Leopate, Chipa Matatu, these ones, they are things that were within your control, you are supposed to be punished because of that. So the formulas are there. Uh, we can attempt, you can attempt the question that is there, question number seven. Uh, that would be good. Now, the next thing that I need to mention is the non-financial performance measures. And the non-financial performance measures, it comes in to complement what we have been doing, the return on investment, the residual in uh, income, and the economic value added statement. Whereby we are saying, we must not just confine ourselves to the financials, to the quantitatives. We must also look at the quality. We must also look at the non-financials. And these non-financials, they are broadly divided into four categories. One is called manufacturing and production. So this is where we look at our manufacturing department and we look at things such as complaints that have been received. How many people have complained about our product? How many people have complimented us? We need to check on that. Uh, we look at uh, the measurement of scraps. How many items have been rejected out of the total that we have produced? We look at the stock turnover ratios, uh, the rate at which we are selling, the stocks, the closing stocks. Are our closing stocks increasing or are they decreasing? Those are things we need to check. Number two, there is the Department of Sales and Marketing. Now, sales and marketing, you need to check things such as customer satisfaction analysis. And when you're looking at whether your customers are satisfied, you look at things such as the compliments they give. You look at uh, situations like how many customers there you keep change, how many customers are complaining, so how many customers are making noise. Those are indicators of customer satisfaction or customer dissatisfaction. You look at sales per 100 customers. Every 100 customers who came to your shop, how many ended up buying? How many ended up buying what? You need to check on that. It's also known as strike rate. Uh, you look at the salaries of your people. Are you paying your people good salary? And when we talk of good salary, that is something that is uh, highly debatable. But at least you must not be paying peanuts because when you pay people very little money and they are hungering a lot of your money, chances are they might uh, start misappropriating. They might uh, be tempted to misuse. The issues of delays when customers request for items, are you able to supply within time or you experience a lot of delays? You need to check on that. Uh, number three, you need to check your human resource people. And when it comes to people, there are things that you need to look at. One is the mix of the staff. How mixed are they in terms of gender? Uh, do you have very many men compared with women or vice versa? In terms of the tribe, do you have very many of this tribe compared with this other tribe, uh, age, and so on? Issues to do with the workload analysis. 
you find there are some people in an organization who are given a lot of work, others are given very little work, but the pay is the same. Actually, in some cases, you find the fellows who are given a lot of work, their pay is lower than the fellows who are not given a lot of work. Those are issues that create dissatisfaction, they create bitterness, and eventually they may be harmful to the going concern of the company. Issues to do with labor turnover, how many people are quitting from your company, absence from work, number of applicants for advert, staff evaluation, and so on. And finally, there is the issue of research and development. We must check how much money are we committing to research? What are we discovering? Are we bringing new items? Are the items that we are bringing to the market being acceptable or not? Those are issues that we need to check as far as the non-financials are concerned. Now, there are four parameters or there are four methods that are used in doing this. One is called balanced scorecard. And balanced scorecard, I believe you have come across it in uh, industry management. There is what we call the Boone's building block model. There is what we call the performance pyramid and the performance prism. Now, use of these models, of these uh, non-financials, they have many benefits uh, which are included there. Because of time, we shall look at them. I just want to mention to Dogo uh, the three models. One is uh, the V, Gerard, and Moon's building block. Now, this divides the items of concern into three. We have what we call the dimensions, the standards, and the rewards. Now, in the dimensions, we are looking at what we call critical success factors. We look at our competitiveness. We look at our financial performance our quality of service, the flexibility, resource utilization, and uh, innovation. Those are called critical success factors. Then when it comes to standards, uh, like the ones we are using computing variances, we look at three things. We look at the ownership who develop these standards. We look at the achievability, how possible are they to be realized? Uh, fairness, how fair they are, are we subjecting everyone to the same level of standards while uh, knowing that people are different, we need to appreciate that. Then we have the issue of rewards. And when it comes to rewards, is it very clear that when I do this, I will be rewarded this, or when I do not do this, this is the punishment. We need to check on that, how clear it is. And the motivation, when you give, for example, in a class like this one, uh, I say anyone who will answer my question, I will give them one sharing. Now, that may not motivate you people. Uh, or maybe someone like, uh, a teacher like me, someone buys me uh, a tropical sweet. Now, that is not bad. It's a good gift, it's a good reward. But it's not really most likely going to generate motivation. Uh, the other thing is controllability. Uh, because when it comes to rewards, people can manipulate them to achieve other goals. Uh, so we need to check. Uh, the award of these rewards is it attached to something else that I'm giving you this award, but after this we shall meet behind the tent and discuss other things. So those are things that you need to check uh, about that model. The second model is called the performance pyramid, and uh, this performance pyramid divides business into three levels. One, there is what we call the divisions. Then we have the business operating systems, and then we have departments. Now, these three are further subdivided into four, as you can see. The very first one begins with the corporate vision, which is further broken into two. You break it into the market, where do you want to, uh, to operate, and how much money do you have, or how much money do you want to, uh, to make. Then you break those two into three others, uh, where you tell us about the customer satisfaction, you tell us about flexibility and productivity. Then that one is broken into four others, where you discuss about the quality, the delivery, the cycle time, and the waste that is going to be realized. So all these, again, you can group them into two according to this model. Uh, one, it is where you look at external effectiveness, and number two, you look at uh, internal eff effectiveness or efficiency. The last one is called performance prism. Uh, performance prism. And this simply involves asking five questions. Asking five questions. And uh, the first question is about the stakeholders. Who are our key stakeholders? 
in a school like this one, we must know who are the key stakeholders. And number two, we must ask, what strategies are we going to use to satisfy our stakeholders? Because when we know, we, we, we discover who our stakeholders are, we must also have discovered their needs. So what strategies are we using to ensure that we satisfy their needs? The other thing is that the processes, after we have the strategies, we must develop the processes that will be used to satisfy the needs of our stakeholders. Uh, then we have the issue of uh, the capabilities. What capabilities do we have? Uh, are we able to do this and this? Uh, like now when you, uh, you, you hear IABC talking of digital, do they have that capability? We have internet everywhere in the country, in every polling station. We need to check on that. And finally, what is the stakeholders' contribution? It is true you want these services from Destiny, but what is your contribution? It is true you want this service from this company. What is your contribution towards achieving that? So that is what we call performance pleasing. And that brings us to the end of our lesson today and also to the end of our syllabus. So as I said when I began discussing this adult, it's a very, very important component as far as your exam is concerned. So make sure you get time and read through the theory. Just theoretical, most of the things are theories. So take time, read them, even as you check what is contained in the past papers. So when we meet on Monday, we will start uh, revising the paper of our city, going backwards, and I think that is good. So thank you so much. Have a nice weekend.